Good morning. I can always count on you. Welcome to Truth Point. Um, it is so delightful to see your faces. Yay! I know, I was kind of reading the room, and I'm like, I think, I think we're okay there. Um, my name is Emily Malone. It is a pleasure to be with you, um, those of you in person, as well as those of you joining us online. Um, we are very, very glad you're here, and I'm glad to be able to welcome you this morning. Um, if you have not grabbed a worship guide, you probably should. Um, it's kind of the cheat sheet to everything I say. It's all in here. So it's just right out there if you missed it. If you are online, you can find it at truthpoint.org. You can get, the, get it off the website. It also helps us just with the lyrics of the songs and the responsive reading. Um, and in it, we've got our QR code. So if you have not been receiving our weekly emails, which are super helpful for knowing what's going on and staying connected, um, please scan the QR code. Or again, you can go to truthpoint.org connect. I just have a couple announcements straight from this page that I'd like to share with you. I'm particularly excited about the women's book study that's starting this week. You can either attend ladies on Monday evening or Tuesday morning for Tim Keller's Prodigal God. Um, I just read the introduction this morning. I'm super excited to be a part of that. Um, if you're like me and you're a teacher and you actually have some extra time in the summer, it's a great time to join in and I'm looking forward to making some new friends, I hope. So again, that's Monday evening or Tuesday morning. It's starting this week. More information at truthpoint.org slash events. Um, also, there is another Knowing the Faith seminar. It is next week at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, June 16th at Lake Osborne Presbyterian Church, led by our own Dr. Tim Sansbury, leading a lecture on God, time, and eternity. So, I mean, at least that's an easy topic, right? Um, sounds like a really good one. Um, and then finally, you can support our ministries at truthpoint.org give, or um, you can still use checks and cash, and we have offering boxes out in the front. We just don't want anyone to feel led to give out of compulsion, but rather with a cheerful heart. Um, and that is all I have for us. I have a few more things from Pastor Clint. It is great to see everyone. I mean, really see everyone today. <laughs> um, I just have one announcement, the last announcement, that reminder that our Lord Jesus Christ not only died for our sins, but that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Please stand for our call to worship. Our call comes from Deuteronomy 4.35. To you it is shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. The Lord is God and there is no other besides him. He reveals himself in creation. He reveals himself in his word. He's revealed himself in our salvation. And he calls us before him as his children to worship, to gather together. Let us worship before our heavenly father. Let's sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We've spent the last year trying to sing with masks on, so please join me now as we sing out loud together. Yeah. 
First verse again.
have your seats. Well, today is not a typical uh, morning, as you can see, as I have uh, three young men standing standing here. Uh, today, we uh, each year we do something called Celebration Sunday, where we acknowledge, commemorate, and celebrate the students who have graduated. And uh, before me are three students who uh, have finished high school, and they are moving on to college. And so I am, yes, yes. And uh, I couldn't help but say a few words as these three have been a very integral part of, of our youth group for, for as, as long as it's been around. And so I have a few things to say, for a few words to give to, to all three of these, these young men. Cademan Yuren, who's on the far side. Cademan will be going to Florida Gulf Coast University and studying data analytics. And Cademan, if I could give a few words. Now, all these words I'm going to share are things that all these men, young men, exemplify. But in Cademan, I've noticed um, his growth as a humble leader, which is a very rare combination. Cademan seeks to lift others up, and in so doing, helps people to see that the best leaders in life take the path of a servant. I have noticed this in him in a tremendous way, and Florida Gulf Coast University where it will be a place where light shines in the darkness because he is there. Noah McFarland, who's in the middle, Florida Polytechnic University, where Noah will be studying mechanical engineering. Noah has exemplified uh, these two words a lot, faithful and kind, faithful and kind. If someone or something is faithful, you can stand on it and depend on it and know that it will not break. If someone is kind, you feel very safe around them. Noah is faithful and kind. And Florida Polytechnic University will be a different place after Noah spends his time there. And Cole, Cole Wagnon. He's going to the University of Kansas where he's gonna be studying business. Um, Cole is strong and caring. Uh, so I've noticed Cole has great strength. We have been to the gym a few times together. So it's really true. I mean, he was, he was putting up more than me, and I was like, oh, no, man. Um, anyway, but inner strength is really what I mean. He really has a, a profound inner strength in life, and I've recognized that through challenges um, he's worked through, and I've seen him go through them with strength inside. Um, but he also has a really genuine care for other people. And to find someone who's strong but also cares about other people a lot is, is rare. And um, in the business world, you know, Cole's going to hear the phrase, and we all know you step on others to get yourself ahead. But Cole's going to be the kind of person who lifts up the person who's been stepped on and help them to get ahead. That's the type of person that this man is, and really all of these, all of these guys are. Uh, the University of Kansas will be a better place, Cole, after your time there. And a final word is, I'm just really going to miss you guys. Um, yeah, uh, they've been a big part of the youth group, and... Uh, They've helped form the culture that we have and who the youth group is, and these guys are going to be really missed. And everything you've done, you've, you've taught so many of us so many things, and you all are amazing friends and people who follow Christ wholeheartedly. And so I'm thankful for you all, and we, all, we are supporting you and here for you. Um, and I hope to you know, see you guys uh, sometime, maybe visit or uh, online Stone Age over there, some board game stuff. So we're nerds. All right, anyway. So I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Clint, who's going to pray for these guys, and uh, yeah.
Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you for the work that you have done in the lives of Cademan, Noah, and Cole. These young men come to a significant milestone in life as they transition from high school to college and to an exciting future. We praise you for the words that we just heard spoken over them, Father, the, the words that uh, give evidence to the godly people that they have become. We thank you. As they move forward in life, may you continue to work in their lives. We ask that you would bless each of them with remembrance of the biblical and godly teachings that they have received from their parents and from their church family. We ask that your word would be bound to their hearts, guiding their thoughts and actions. We ask that in the midst of trials, difficulties, temptations, and disappointments, that you would give them wisdom and help them to stand firm as children of God and as ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We ask that you would keep them safe and secure. We ask that their lives would be filled with the joy, joy, deep joy, Father, of knowing you and walking with you day after day. And as Cademan, Noah, and Cole come before this significant change in life, may they find confidence in that you are the one who never changes, that you love them, you're with them, and you will never leave them. We praise you for these young men and ask that your blessings would be upon them, and we lift them up to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Oh, look at everyone's faces. This is why I'm not even going to try this. This is fair. Here we go. Okay. My name's Andrew, um, and uh, I'm on the session, and um, Robbie needs to get used to younger people being stronger than him. It gets worse, not better, <laughs> very quickly. I forgot my glasses. Um, yeah, I was walking. Uh, I was, um, was walking through my house yesterday, and my daughter Sophie. I think it was Sophie said, "Who are you talking to, Dad?" And I, I wasn't sure. Um, I literally, I had to think. Who was it? Was I praying? No, I, I think I was talking to myself. Um, but I think about prayer. And I, I, um, I, I, when I come up to pray with you, my goal is that you would see Jesus, right? Because I want you to love him, right? So, so I, I'm not silly. You know, I'm, I'm very silly. My, my, one of my best friends, Bud, knows that. And, um, but I, I want you to know Jesus. I want you to see Jesus. That's all. That's what I want you to see and how wonderful he is. Because I forget that every day. And, um, and I was thinking of this morning, I, I was uh, listening to, or yesterday, Cindy Lauper. This song, Time After Time. <laughs> when you're lost, you can look and you will find me. <laughs> I mean... It's amazing. She's singing that about a love interest, but we can sing that about the King of Kings. We take over because his kingdom reigns. And I was reading Psalm 121 yesterday because I was having a tough day. Um, not just talking to myself. <laughs> and it says in, in Psalm 121.5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. 
he, and we see that in the light of Jesus, he will keep you. So talk to him this week. Talk to him, talk to him, talk. Jesus is, he is with us. We just sang that, uh, you know, in, in great is thy faithfulness. He is, he is near and he is with us. So I want you to talk, go to him this week. If you've ignored him for a month or a year, go to him. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He is good. So let's go to him now. And, uh, and he is with us. And he is listening. And he is faithful. And one day we will see him face to face. Father, we are way more desperate for you than we know. Teach us to be desperate for you. To delight in you. To know your son Jesus and his faithfulness to us, his sacrifice, that we would know his love, that we wouldn't be desperate for the love of the world, but we would be delighted in the love of Jesus. Even as we see him on the cross, we remember that we mock him and we were his enemy, and yet he went to the cross and how beautiful he is. Lord, in light of that, would you help us to be honest with you now as we confess our sins? And we do that now. Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness, your mercy, and your grace. We, we have your peace, and we thank you for that peace. I thank you. We pray this morning together for Ronnie Perry and New Song Church. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would provide all that they need that they, you would give Ronnie uh, renewed strength as he rebuilds the church with your strength after COVID. And um, pray that you would ri raise up plenty of workers for him and plenty of finances for them. And I pray for Walter Barrows this morning a young man among us who, Lord, you have, you have used to share joy with me because of his love for you. And I thank you for him and his life. And I, I pray for his work with Youth for Christ. Pray that, that he would have joy as he evangelizes. Um, I pray that more students would participate in his work with Youth, youth for Christ, that they would they would come, they would come out, they would see, Lord, the value of, of your son, Jesus. And I pray for his studies at Palm Beach State, that you would help him to focus and, and to enjoy learning. Um, and Father, we thank you for this service, and uh, we pray for Josh Malone, Lord, uh, as he, as he preaches this morning, Lord, um, we all have heavy hearts. We have a thousand thoughts. And Lord, you know them all, and you still love us. But would you quiet our hearts this morning to hear from you through Josh and pray that he would speak with joy and clarity and truth. And we end this prayer by praying the prayer that you taught us when you said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the responsive reading 
um, is on page unnumbered, uh, somewhere in the middle, Psalm 97. The Lord reign, the, sorry, yes, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many coastlands be glad. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. All worshipers of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. Please stand.
your spirit upon the
chorus one more time, just the voices. There is freedom, taste and see. Hear the call, come to me. Run into his arms of grace. Your burden carrying, he will take. Amen. Well, this time, our gospel kids, uh, first through fourth grade, uh, can head on out. The rest can take a seat here, uh, follow the leaders uh, out the back doors there. And if you haven't checked in, uh, if parents haven't checked their kids in for gospel kids, they can follow back as well to do that. Well, I'm Josh Malone, and I was installed last week here as an assistant pastor, and they put me right to work. Um, so <laughs> here I am this week. Um, I'm going to take us a little, a little bit of a detour uh, from our series in Mark while Pastor Tim is again on vacation. Uh, I did put on my Pastor Tim uniform, uh, a khaki jacket, <laughs> jeans, and light shirt. So I, you'll have to tell him about that when he comes back. Um, we're looking at the book of Acts, uh, and we're reading through a section of Acts where Paul is finishing up a part of his missionary journey in Ephesus. And we see something there central about Paul's missionary journeys uh, and central about us uh, that fundamentally, we are worshipers. So please turn with me to Acts chapter 19, uh, or in the bulletin, you'll see that right across from the song. And Acts chapter 19, we'll read the last half of the chapter, verses 21 through 41. Acts 19, 21 through 41. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. And about that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemides, Bought no, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together, and with the workmen in similar trades, and he said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but also but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is a danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she who all Asia and the whole world worship. When they had heard this, they were enraged, and crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion. And they rushed together into the theater, dragging them uh, with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. And when Paul wished to go among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. Even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. And most of them did not know what they had come together for. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, who the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized he was a Jew, for about two hours they cried out with one voice, Great is Artemides of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemides and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, as are the proconsuls, Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. 
for we are really in danger of being charged with a rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear your word. I ask that you would open my lips to proclaim it and our hearts to receive it. Consecrate these moments together by your spirit and through your son. And we pray this in your triune name. Amen. So at first glance, this text, it might seem like a strange place to pick up Paul's story. But I'd like to suggest there's something extraordinarily illuminating here about, about us, about human nature. More so, this is a text that gives a lot of insight at the tail end of a pandemic. Cultural moments like this, they, they do provide an opportunity. And it's been a tough 16 months or so for all of us. Um, it's been a genuine medical crisis, right? Over, over half a million deaths have been attributed to COVID. Uh, and people here have friends and, and family that they've lost. And that's terrible. And we want to take that with the utmost seriousness. And yet, there's something else I want to draw on about this experience we've come through. The reactions that this, this crisis can evoke from us I think of one of those, hoarding toilet paper, <laughs> right? I mean, that's kind of weird. Uh, it's strange, but it's actually not that strange if you think the world is going to end. Then you think, well, you know, th this, this actually might be the kind of thing you'd want to grab hold of. Hoarding toilet paper is a sort of microcosm for what goes on in our hearts. When we see something really serious and, and maybe it becomes disproportionate in some of our reactions, all-encompassing in some of our reactions. Sometimes those kind of reactions take on a culture-shaping force, uh, exerting a godlike power over us. But what's happening is they're actually idols <laughs> gripping our hearts. So what can we do? And I'd like to show you how this text, this text and throughout Scripture, shows us how the gospel can help us discern these idols and expose these idols and ultimately destroy these idols. It shows us how to discern them and therefore to expose them and finally to destroy them. First, discerning idols. Uh, in the book of Acts, Paul is often going around city to city and observing the worship and then preaching after that. Here in Acts 19, what you see is Paul was making plans there to return to Greece, that's to Macedonia and Achaia, and then to Jerusalem and then to go on to Rome. And this riot breaks out in Ephesus, and that's what you read about here. And this text is intriguing. I'm sure you noticed that as I read through it for all kinds of reasons. One of them is it doesn't actually give the sermon that Paul is preaching there, which is a bit unusual for Acts. What it does give you is a very brief synopsis of the type of thing Paul had been preaching. When I read the text, I slowed down at that part. Demetrius, one of these craftsmen, had made these little Artemides statuettes. And in verse 26, Paul says, gods made with hands are not gods. What is Paul doing there? Well, he's discerning and he's exposing the idols. And he's doing that and going after that in his preaching. We don't really learn much more about that in this passage, the detail of that. But you can look at the rest of the book of Acts and see a little bit more. In Acts 14, you'll see Paul goes to Lystra there, and Paul and Barnabas get mistaken uh, for Hermes and for Zeus. And when that happens, they tear their robes in response because that's, that's the horror that they have at that blasphemy. And they preach the true God as creator and sustainer of the world. And then in Acts 16, as you come along there, in Philippi, Paul and Silas come along and they exercise a demon from a young girl there who's being exploited for fortune telling. And in doing so, they end up breaking a sort of religious economic uh, collusion that's going on there, which is actually a form of idolatry. And probably the most well-known account happens just before this in Acts 17, where Paul is in Athens at Mars Hill, and he sees idols, and he preaches against them. In Acts 17, in verse 16, Paul walks around the city, 
and he, and he sees that the city is full of these idols. And so first he recognizes this. He discerns this. And one thing you see in the, Acts, in the book of Acts and actually in the rest of Scripture is the gospel message is transformative specifically because it helps you to see these idols. You need to look around and figure out what's there. And Paul recognizes that every gender, every race, every culture, every individual has a set of idols. And he carefully observes these things and he knows what they are. And second, you notice what Paul does is he exposes them then. He confronts them. In Acts 17, chapter 22, or verse 22, when Paul is speaking on Mars Hill, he preaches against these idols. And he does so because he knows again that every individual, every community, every culture that's not rooted in the glory and the grace of God is centered on some other created thing in God's place. They're looking to something to, to save them to rescue them, to, to put their hope and, and their meaning into something that's not God. And so here in Acts 19, you see that Artemides has eventually ended up becoming essentially a goddess of, of business in some ways. And that's because Artemides, if you know a, a bit about your mythology here, was the goddess of the forest and, and of the hills and, and of the ground. Uh, and therefore, uh, of fertility, uh, in that sense, and therefore of the good harvest, and in some ways then she controlled financial prosperity in this area. On top of that, you notice what the city clerk says in verse 35. A meteorite had fallen down somewhere near Ephesus, and people looked at that meteorite, and they thought it looked like a statue of Artemides, and they said, she sent us her own image, right? Uh, that this seems to be what had happened, and here's what they did. They set up that meteorite, and they created a temple to Artemides. And it was even bigger than the Pantheon in that time, seven times bigger. Um, it was actually one of the wonders of the ancient world. It, everybody wanted to come see what they had set up here. Um, and so it was a tourist attraction, kind of like a Disney World of antiquity. People would come and see this thing. And as a result of it, there was all kinds of commercialism that was tied to this. Uh, it, people that were tied to the temple became very rich. And Ephesians became this financial and business center related to this. And Artemides was the sort of saint of this, uh, the goddess of business. And if you wanted to make a lot of money, you sacrificed to her. And you served her. And you honored her. And now you get some sense of what they're afraid of. Because... If people turn away from Artemides here, the whole economy might collapse, li literally, right? Because you're not buying these little statues and, and, and serving her in this way. And what's more, if people turn away from that, there's a religious component here too. If you aren't honoring her, well, she might not bless us. The whole culture, the verse 27, the whole world might, might fall apart here. And what's more, in Athens and in Ephesus here, these gods, they literally overshadowed the marketplaces. Um, and that's not just because they were uh, some kind of architectural motif. Instead, it was the manifestation, right, of what we've been talking about, that every culture, unless it's dominated by the grace and glory of God, will be dominated by something else. And every place Paul went, he goes after this. He speaks about this and preaches about this. And today, we actually see the same thing. Now, I realize when I say that, there's probably a, a bit of an objection. Uh, maybe when you hear that and you think idols, you have sort of literal statues in mind, or, or maybe the next reality show winner, right? Um, but our objection, I think, goes something like this. Well, of course, Paul had to deal with this kind of a thing in his day, but we live in a modern Western culture, right? A couple thousand years later, uh, we don't really have idols like this. We don't bow down to statues like they did. Why should we be concerned about idols? And it seems to me that the short answer is, biblically, don't be so naive. Right? Physical, external idolatry, bowing down and worshiping something, is connected to the underlying sin of creating and worshiping something in our hearts. In other words, you can make anything an idol. It doesn't have to be a statue, and for us, it, it almost never is. By the way, if you want to read a more expanded treatment on this, uh, about what the Bible says about idolatry, I'd commend uh, Tim Keller's book, Counterfeit Gods. It's been really helpful for me 
Uh, I'm basically summarizing on this point now a little bit about what he says. And what he shows is in the Old Testament, if you kind of look across what's happening with idolatry, there, there are really a couple primary, three primary metaphors that are used to help us think about idolatry. The first one is a marital metaphor, a marital metaphor. And that's because the Bible shows us we love our false gods and therefore we commit spiritual adultery with them. We love our false gods and therefore we, we commit spiritual adultery with them. Whereas Christ is our true spouse, the Old Testament says we love our false gods and therefore we commit spiritual adultery with them. You can see that if you read Jeremiah chapter 2 through 4, um, Ezekiel chapter 16, the first four chapters of Hosea, they all use this metaphor pretty expansively. Second, there's a religious metaphor for idolatry, a religious metaphor that says we trust in our false gods and therefore we look for them to save us. We trust in our false gods and therefore we look for them to save us. The Bible says that God in Christ is our true savior and yet we trust in these false gods and we look to them to save us. Deuteronomy 32 uses this image. Um, Judges chapter 10 uses this image, as does Isaiah chapter 45. Third, there's a, a political or a covenantal image about idolatry, a political or a covenantal image. And that one says we obey our false gods, and therefore they become our spiritual masters. We, we obey our false gods, and therefore they become our spiritual masters. Whereas Christ is our true king. Israel demonstrates we obey these false gods and they become our spiritual masters. You see that in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and chapter 12, um, also in Judges chapter 8. What you do when you look at that quick survey is you notice that a great deal of idolatry is actually not concerned with physically bowing down. But when you look at anything to give you what only God can give you, that's idolatry. And what you see today is, is we don't really physically nail down to things like a statue of Aphrodite, but boy, many young women are driven to depression and eating disorders by obsessive convulsion with their image, their body image, right? And we push that in society. And we might not actually sacrifice to Artemides, but we can actually sacrifice <laughs> our family and our children in a way by neglecting them for a successful career or for finances and trying to gain more wealth or more status. Those idols that I've just mentioned, they're on prominent display in Palm Beach County. Just look around. So let me push a bit further. What is an idol? What is an idol? An idol is anything that, that's so central to your life that if you lost it, your life would hardly feel worth living. An idol is something that has such a controlling position in your heart that you can spend most of your time and, and energy, most of your finances and resources going after it without a second thought. And it can be a career or making money. It, it can be a family or your children. It can be your achievement or social standing. It could be a romantic relationship or approval from others. It could be your own competence. It could be any sort of thing like this, even your security. It could be your brains or your beauty. It could be even your success in Christian ministry or theological education. An idol is whatever you look at and you say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll know my life has meaning. Then, then I'll know I'm okay. Then I'll know I have value and I'm safe and secure. When you take something that's time-bound, that's finite, and you make it into an absolute, when you take something that's good that God has given us, but you make it ultimate, you've created an idol. And you're in the thrall of that. And that's the reason why these pagans we read about, they weren't crazy. To have sex gods and work gods and play gods and nature gods and national gods. There was a God for, for everything. You know why? Because anything can be a God, right? Anything can be a God or a deity in the culture 
at, at large, not just in us. And because Paul, and I hope we can see that from this text, he saw, he discerned, and he was really effective in administering the gospel. Which leads us to our second point, exposing these idols. In that verse that gives the synopsis of Paul's preaching, you might notice Paul didn't simply say, hey, there are these idols around. Instead, he said, these man-made gods, they're no gods at all. They're no gods at all. He knew exactly how to expose them. How did he do that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, one of the oddities of this passage is it doesn't really contain that sermon from Paul. And we realize a lot of stuff happened in Paul's ministry. And you might ask, well, why does Luke include this account, especially when there's no sermon? What most commentators will say on that question is one reason that this particular account seems to be here is because the story so clearly exposes the idols, um, especially how it ends, what you see at the end of the story. In the text, in verse 27, the idol worshipers say, right, our social order is threatened. Our culture is in danger. And why do they conclude that? Well, these Christians, right, it's them. They're coming around and preaching this message. They're the ones who have given rise to this dangerous situation. And so the Ephesians stage a demonstration. Then in the middle of the passage, you can almost see Luke's sense of humor here coming out. In verse 32, when he says, the majority of the crowd didn't even know what they were gathered and rioting about. And then finally, at the end of the passage, in verse 40, the city clerk says, guess what? Our social order and our culture, it's in greater danger because of you than because of the Christians. Why is that? Well, the reason is the idols never deliver. They actually never deliver. The idols, when they're threatened, there's always chaos, there's always confusion, and they're always violent. And when a person is in the thrall of an idol, they can actually look pretty reasonable, pretty respectable on the outside until you threaten the idol. And then they come unglued. And that's what this story exposes. The weakness of the idol is it can never make good on its promises. The security, the social order, the deliverance that it promises. Remember, the complaint against the Christians is they were jeopardizing the social order by saying there's one true God and the other gods are no gods at all. But this incident exposes the social order is in greater danger from the idolaters themselves. Okay. So what does that mean for us? Well, we're on what seems to be the tail end, as I said, of, of a really tough year, year and a half. One of the gifts of a trial like that is what it exposes. I think back to a little bit over a year ago, and our economy came to a grinding halt, right? There was all sorts of signs of this. It was strange times for us. The NBA stopped. March Madness didn't happen, right? It was weird. Disney World closed. Uh, the stock market dropped precipitously. People lost jobs. Weirdly, some people made money. It was a strange upheaval kind of time. And in the thick of it, all kinds of pronouncements came out. If you shut this or that down, it'll kill the economy, right? We said. And others said, if you don't shut this or that down, it'll kill a ton of people, right? What was happening there? I don't think it was so simple as everyone thought they were experts. Instead, there's something tied to, if we don't do this, the whole world is going to cease to function. Verse 27, the whole world. Notice when we speak in sort of cosmic ways like that, about money, about commerce, there might be an idol at play. Let me push a bit further. In the midst of this pandemic, we had an election. The election got heated, right? It got contested. And as the dust settled, when votes were certified, we had a new president-elect. Now, whatever you think about that, jump a few months later, six months ago. And at this point, it's been six months. And, and I hope we can have a little sober reflection. On January 6th, a crowd gathered 
at the seat of power at Washington. And the old social and political order felt threatened. And people came unglued. Not just storming a theater, but Congress. And a riot and an insurrection broke out. And there in January 2021, we have a scene that weirdly parallels some of these things we see in Acts 19 with chants, right, decrying the loss of an old order and calling for its reassertion by force, if necessary. Invictives calling for a reversal, threatening bodily harm to those who were deemed responsible. Yet no one in the crowd was as bold as the town clerk in Acts to say, well, the courts are open. If you have evidence, bring charges and this can be settled. To be clear, I'm not just picking on one side of a debate. Go back four years before, January 2017. There was another riot on Inauguration Day, including destruction of property, a limo being set fire. So hear me. The pandemic only exposed deeper idols that were already there. Why do normally sane people storm the Capitol? It's not just complaint about an election, but a belief that the whole world will end if we don't act. Because your hope and, and your future are hung on that outcome, on this outcome. And that drives you to do things you, you swore you'd never do. And I know many of us would never storm a capital, but we might boldly chant on social media, right? Check your feed. This might again be a sign of a political idol. So here at this point, I, I need to consider another potential objection. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Glad we got through that. Let me address another potential objection here. Not that. You might agree with me that there's a real emphasis in Scripture on idolatry, a real clash between idolatry and the gospel. You might see that. But I think we probably tend to think of idolatry as like really exceptional behavior, right? I, like I'd never do something like that, storm the Capitol. But we tend to say, sure, yeah, idols of the heart, they're dangerous. They threaten our well-being. Uh, they oppose the gospel. But what you're describing is idolatry. Isn't that what truly sick people or truly disturbed people have? Isn't that, isn't that sort of exceptional behavior? People then end up institutionalized maybe with psychological or pathological problems. Isn't idolatry just really an exceptional sort of thing? Again, it seems to me the response to this from this text and elsewhere is don't be so short-sighted, right? What I mean is we all, all of us, Christians included, we all are sinners. And we all want to rely on, on ourselves and on things around us in some way that doesn't rely on Christ for our salvation. And we, we end up relying in various ways on other things. We end up loving and, and trusting and obeying something else that's not God and turning that thing in, into a pseudo-savior. We think we're going to gain control of our lives, but we actually end up, like the Ephesians, losing control. Martin Luther is so helpful here. In his longer catechism, he says, the first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. That commandment grounds all of the rest. In other words, you don't break commandment two through ten without first breaking that commandment. It, it, it's the sin underneath the sin. Romans 1 is really illuminating here. Romans 1, Paul is talking about sin in general, kind of tracing that story out in Scripture. And he's talking about the whole human race, and he ends up saying in that first chapter that idolatry of the heart is right underneath all of our sin. Romans 1, 25, he says, whatever we worship and center our lives on, we're, we're compelled to, to follow and to obey and serve that. And then verse 26, he goes on to say, this means our hearts fall into the grip of these overwhelming desires and, and, and drives and ultimately, we get entrapped by a device of our own making. Look, why do people, Christians, sometimes do unconscionable things like leaving a spouse and family, like, like getting caught up in drugs and alcohol, 
like committing financial fraud or other various forms of destructive behavior. Often when we run into that, we say things like, that just doesn't make sense. And that's true. It, it doesn't make sense, but it doesn't really explain much. Maybe we put all the emphasis then on, on our will, and we say, ah, they're just making bad choices. And that's true, but it doesn't really probe deeply enough. And what we need to see is the biblical answer is the human heart is an idol factory, to borrow from John Calvin. We're actually made to worship. And, in, and we set up these pseudo-saviors in our hearts, and we run after them, and we love, and we trust, and obey them. And unless you can discern and expose that pattern, you won't be able to make much sense of the world. You won't be able to make much sense of your own life. Let me try to give you a really practical example of this. Emily and I just celebrated 20 years of marriage. <laughs> Thank you. You're clapping for her right now, um, no doubt. Um, she has endured me. One of the joys and challenges of marriage is you are around each other all the time, right? You're around each other all the time. And when you're around someone all the time, like eventually, you just start acting like yourself. Um, <laughs> It doesn't take that long, right? Days, maybe weeks, if you're, if you're particularly good. Uh, but because in front of everybody else, we probably put up a little bit of a front. But with, with your spouse, you can't help but acting like yourself in marriage uh, because she's there all the time, right? All the time. And you just start acting like yourself. She starts acting like herself, and the honeymoon's over, um, as they say. I remember one of the things we did notice uh, early on in marriage is we were both willing, uh, to put it nicely, to stretch the truth on occasions, right? More bluntly, to lie. We began to notice that when we lied, uh, we did lie in really different ways. Uh, for example, if somebody saw me uh, over at PBA and they said, hey, ha have you read this book? And I said, oh yeah, I just haven't made it through it yet. Um, and as I walk away, I realize I just lied. Actually, I might know about that book. I might even have flipped, you know, through the cover and page or so of it, but I'm actually not reading it. Um, now, I lied uh, ignorantly, maybe subtly there, but without even thinking about it. And the funny thing is, my wife would never lie about something like that. She would be happy to be perceived uh, ignorant and not having read that, to give someone the joy of saying, let me tell you about this. Um, and because of that, because of that, um, it's true she wouldn't. She could look at me and say, why did you do that? I'd never do something like that, right? And I could look at her and say, why do you do this? I'd never do what you've done here. And we can actually feel really kind of a little self-righteous, right, and over the other person. Now, here you start to realize something. Why do we lie, right? Well, you could say, because well, we're sinners. And that's true. We lie because we're sinners. Okay, but why do we lie in the particular ways that we do? Right? In my case, I have an idol. I want to be known as someone who's smart. Right? I want to be known as someone who's in the know. And it's very important to me. Right? I have a reputation idol. And I might be willing to spoil somebody else's joy in telling me something so long as I'm known as being smart. Why? Well, because being seen as intelligent is most important to me in that moment. Now, Emily has a whole different set of idols, and I'm not here. It's not my job to confess her sins. I'll just confess <laughs> mine. But realize this, right? When I lie, it's not so simple as because I'm bad. There's a lot more going on to it than that. I lie because at the moment I lie, Jesus Christ is not the most important to my self-image and my happiness and my security. Something else is. It's my reputation, and I can actually say with my head that Jesus Christ has, has saved me and my value is there because he loves me. And yet, deep, deep down, my heart can operate on a different principle. I have a different justification in practice in my life. I have a different functional savior. Do you see that? Do you see that? You can't really understand your moral failings without understanding idolatry. You can't really understand our, our sinful tendencies without understanding idolatry. You can't really understand the root of any sin that we commit without understanding idolatry. 
And, and the fact of the matter is, we all have various idols, little gods, that we love and that we trust and that we obey. And we can make almost anything into an idol. Let me give you one more example of a kind of idol. You see money and politics here in Ephesus are lying because we long for reputation. How about religious truth? Well, I'm going to be careful how I say this, but as evangelicals, we might tend to make an idol sometimes out of the truth, capital T, right? As someone teaching in Christian academia, I know this very well. Um, it's extremely convicting, and I constantly have to fight against this. So here's what I mean by truth, capital T. Is it possible to say, I'm okay, I'm right with God because of the rightness of my belief? Instead of, I'm okay with God because Jesus died for me. Right? Those, those are two different things. Is it possible to rest your salvation functionally in the correctness of your doctrine? And it seems to me the answer is yes. Like we, can, we can slide that way probably pretty easily. And just like money worshipers, they think they're just hardworking. And political worshipers just think they're just protecting the people. Those of us who worship the truth say, well, I'm just devoted to what's right and to God. But we're not. Remember what an idol is again. An idol is looking to some created thing and resting in that instead of God for your life. You're taking something that's good and you're making it so crucial to your meaning and to your life more so than God. And once we understand that, once we can see that, once we can have that exposed, we've gone a long way. And that brings me to my very last, very brief, but most important point. How do you actually do something? How do you actually not just discern and expose these idols, but how do you actually destroy them? It's usually the case that once someone sees this sort of pattern in their life, once an idol is exposed, they think, you know, simply by an act of will, I can just get rid of this. I'm going to say, I am not going to be enslaved to this anymore. But that'll never work. That actually will never work. Look back at Acts 19, chapter 19, verses 30 and 31. When Paul wished to go into the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs the chief citizens and men of power who were friends of his, they sent to him, and they were urging him not to venture into the theater. What we see is that when the idols are opposed, it's very dangerous. It's dangerous, right? Like I said, the idols never deliver on the peace that they promise. However, regarding the idols themselves, what they are, the Bible is strangely mixed which is, which is a strange thing to say about the Bible, that it would be mixed on a topic. What I mean is the biblical writers are sort of ambivalent about whether the idols are something or nothing. On the one hand, you read that the idols are empty. They're worthless things. They're, they're things that you've created, and they don't really have any power to give you what you want. It's, it's a handmade God, right? That's all an idol is. And, and you can see Paul's preaching pushes on that. On the other hand, read, read across the story, right? See what happens here. Idols seem to wield this enormous, almost demonic power. When the Ephesians have their political and their commercial and their religious devotion threatened, they get angry, they get violent, everything comes apart. Here's why. Idols are nothing, but through them, the powers and the principalities, the forces of darkness, control us. This is how scripture seems to hold together these two ends. The, the idols themselves are nothing, but through them, the, what the scripture calls the powers and the principalities, the enemies of God, act upon us and control us. And that's the reason why, on the one hand, the idols are powerless. They're nothing. But on the other hand, they're unbelievably powerful. And if you oppose them, you take your own life into your hands. And that's the thing you notice here, right? Paul is preaching against these idols, and he risks his own life. And the powers and principalities act against him, but providentially, God 
his hand intervenes, and he's saved. Yet Jesus Christ, he opposes the powers and the principalities in his life, and it costs him his life. Or better, he gives his life. Jesus was picked up by a crowd. Why? Well, because he threatened the social and religious and political order. And the mob yelled, right, crucify him, crucify him. Why did they want to kill him? Because you always take your life into your hands when you oppose the idols. And that's what Jesus did. However, what happened? Defeat gave way to victory. Just as the scriptures bear witness, Colossians 2, 15. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made public spectacle of them, triumphing over them on the cross. What that means is when the world and the flesh and the devil, when all the powers and principalities unleashed their fury on the Son of God, he stepped into their fury and he died. Marvelously, we proclaim, in doing so, he defeated them. He defeated them, he defeated them so utterly and he defeated the powers and the principalities behind them. So what does that mean for you? The good news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ shares that victory with you now. His defeat of the idols of the world is the only thing that can defeat these idols in your life. And because Jesus unmasked these idols and stood against them and defeated the powers behind them, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. And he did that for sinners like me and sinners like you to free us from these idols and to free us to worship him alone in joy and in peace. Come to him today, whoever stands to make intercession for us. Please bow with me in prayer. Father, we thank you for giving us a glimpse in Scripture of what ails our hearts. We pray that you'd help us see our hearts more clearly. We know, Father, that starts with ourselves. We have idols, and we need to be reminded that in Christ you saved us from them. And in our lives, this truth needs to be pushed down deeper and deeper so that by your spirit we can be free from the power of these false gods, so that we can receive and minister your gospel in life-changing ways. Grant that we can and that we will. We pray that through your Son and by your spirit. Amen. Please rise as we continue to worship. Took on flesh, fullness of God. 
God's people said, amen. Here in the power of Christ all stand. We are called to discern, to expose, and destroy the idols in our lives. But we can't do that on our own. We do that by going to Christ, the one who has victory, the one who has triumphed over those idols. Here in the power of Christ, we stand. And if you've come here today and this sermon touched your heart and you realize, you know, I've got idols and you're wondering, can I, can I be forgiven? Then know this, if your faith, your trust is in Jesus Christ and his work, then know that you are forgiven from all of your sins, we are not a perfect people, but we are forgiven. We are forgiven people in Jesus Christ. And now receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. If you're streaming online, go in peace. If you're here, Please have a seat. We'll be serving the Lord's Supper in just a moment. Thank you. 
Thank you.